Hello, I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners in New York, and I want to welcome everyone today to our town hall webinar for VR resources. It's a real pleasure to have a pre and appreciate everyone on the call today. Uh, uh, today, uh, presenting the VR, we have Michael Gunning, who's the chief executive officer. VR Resources is a junior uh, mining company trading in Canada, Canada as well as the United States, and um, they have an opportunity to generate large copper and silver resources uh, to follow up on his past uranium exploration success uh, with two company buyouts. Uh, Mike was involved with, uh, led the charge for Hathor exploration, which had a bidding war for high grade uranium from both Cameco, Cameco as well as Rio Tinto. It was sold for $650 million in 2012. 2012. The stock was up over 200% on the acquisition from Rio Tinto. Um, next came Alpha Resources, which was sold in 2013 for $185 million to Fission Uranium. Uh, Mike is looking forward to doing the same thing for copper, gold resources in Ontario and Nevada with VR Resources. It's a real pleasure to have Michael here with us today, and I'm going to turn the call right over to Mike. Okay, thank you, David. Are we good to go here, Scott? You're good to go. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, the reason that we're here in this point of time for this presentation is, is pretty straightforward. VR is going into three drill programs on three different projects in the next six months, in the back half of 2021. And really, as investors, this is simply your opportunity to consider building a position in, in VR before those drill programs and before those news releases come out, because that's how we create value in our business. Many of you will have seen versions of this slide over the years. There, there's many different ones. It's about the, the process of mineral exploration and mining and how you create value. I'm here to make sure everyone understands that VR lives at the front end of this graph in early stage and blue sky exploration. We are essentially the R&D of the mining industry. When I started, the major mining companies did most of this that transition to junior uh, venture capital exploration uh, in the 80s and 90s. This graph is to show you what is capable in terms of value creation on these drill programs. I, I've put on the, the blue arrow for Rough Rider that David has alluded to with Hathor. Make a discovery and depending on the delineation drilling and the resources, go from essentially zero to a, an M&A sale of 650 million, which is is how we create value for our shareholders in very much the steepest part of our, our business. So part of you are here is that we are just going into that potential threshold. But the other part of you are here is that you are here on the heels of five to seven years of work in Nevada as a private company. VR was formed uh, when I came out of Uranium in 2012, 2014. And so although you have the opportunity to get into a very tight near IPO share structure and blue sky drilling, which all sounds very early, I do want to make sure you know that this is built on the foundation of five to seven years of work, continuous year in and year out, raising money privately here at Benita drilling in 2017, starting work in 2014. But it's the work at Benita that uh, gave us exposure to Nevada. That's how we acquired and started working on the Big Ten Gold Project, which I'll tell you about. Also working on these iron oxide breaches. That's what led us to looking at the iron oxide breccia potential in Ontario. So there is a foundation here at VR. I'm fortunate to have some core shareholders that have been with me almost from the beginning. And now we have the opportunity really to get at the potential value creation moment. So there's kind of two aspects to why we're doing this now. 
Um, David alluded to my career. I'm three generations in this business. It's in my blood. I've I've been doing early stage exploration my own entire career. Um, but I want to make sure you understand that so is my chairman. He and I crossed paths at Tech Cominco. We were fortunate to learn about exploration in a global diversified exploration and mining company. And the importance of that is to understand before you go into mineral exploration, before you explore a property, is to ask yourself, what's the major mining company looking for? What kind of, how would they measure success in exploration? Darren and I both have that. While I was having my success in uranium, Darren was doing the same thing in gold in Ontario and Quebec, first through West Timmins, then through Balmoral, nearly a billion dollars in success, not only in discovery, but success in achieving the M&A, which is where you create value for shareholders. VR is not just Mike Gunning, and VR is really born and bred in this early stage part of the exploration and mining business. Um, that's my last message I want to give to you about VR before we go into these three drill programs, is just to make sure that you understand that the investment you're considering in VR is in a mineral exploration business. And we use venture capital to run our business. It's not the other way around. VR is not a company of venture capital executives in Vancouver looking for a vehicle to run their venture capital business. We do mineral exploration. Darren and I know how to create value. And VR, uh, from the executive up and down, gets its hands dirty. Uh, we don't create value for our shareholders in PowerPoint and on marketing trips. We create value by discovery at the drill bit. In this core shack, here I am with our chief geologist, Justin Daly. It took a while to figure out these rocks. We're now moving into a drill program this summer that I think has the potential to change the Canadian mining space. This is where VR is focused. That's what you're investing in. Okay, let's run through three drill programs that I think um, have the potential to create the kind of value that I built this company for in 2014. They're all going to happen this summer, and that's what I hope you will consider in terms of building a position in VR before this all happens. We're gonna start in Nevada. Uh, this is the Walker Lane Belt in the blue dashed lines, a world famous uh, gold silver belt. And we can start in the top left with Comstock, Virginia City. The two projects I'm gonna talk about with VR are Big Ten and Amsel on gold and Reveille on silver. And I'm gonna start with Reveille and therefore I'm gonna start with Comstock. This Walker Lane belt is just, it's a big crack in the earth. It's seen a lot of extension. It's seen a lot of fluid. And for whatever reason, those fluids have formed some of the world's most famous gold and silver deposits. Comstock is one of them. Discovered in 1850 and production by 1859. And in about 20 years, you produced almost 200 million ounces of silver, 8 million ounces of gold, essentially mined by hand simply a photo I took here um, on a field trip. Uh, it's really hard to imagine doing that today. Uh, and as a segue, this is also to my understanding, literally what got the capital markets going. More than 20 shafts built by private companies and these people went down to San Francisco over the Sierra Nevada to approach industrialists in that city with money to finance their shafts. And that is really the birth of what we know as the capital market system. That's Comstock. That's 200 million ounces of silver. Same belt, same rocks as Reveille. And here we are down at VR's Reveille project where we're just getting going on our first pass uh, drilling that we'll go through this summer. Satellite image. Again, workings here going back to 1870, showings in the hills. And you can see the grade in some of these showings, up to 2,660 grams per ton silver. Many of you will know that many of the operating mines in the silver leading jurisdictions in Peru and Mexico will have economic thresholds of 50 to 100 grams per ton silver. This is telling you that the fluids at Reveille have the potential to create an economic silver system. But look at what's happened with VR's geophysical work, applying state-of-the-art geophysics 
that you couldn't do in 1870. And the magnetic anomalies, the EM anomalies, the resistivity anomalies that are showing us the subsurface where you would expect to see a deep root for the mineralization. These anomalies are happening off on the left of this graph, under cover, where the prospectors of the day were not able to explore. They didn't have these technologies. And in this way, I want VR to do something new. We're not here just to shake off the dust of these old showings. We're looking for the undiscovered source, the really big potential prize of what's driving the high silver grades that you see on this map. And David Manny doesn't want me to. I'd like to talk about this rock for half an hour, just as an example of why we're at Reveille, to understand how much is going on in this rock. The, the modeling color that you see in the bottom of this rock from the early stage alteration, from the rock getting cracked and the carbonate fluids coming in, to these shatter fragments where you've got a fluid that's probably boiling that is literally exploding this rock open, to so much dissolution that these fragments are almost settling on each other. But of course, what gets exciting for the grades that you can see in the top of this slide is this deep red brown silica cement, the cement that's 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 cementing this this breccia. That has freebergite, and that's carrying, in this case, 2,200 grams per ton silver. There's a lot going on in this rock, and there's a lot of silver in this fluid. And that's why VR has been working on this for a year. The data on the right is just to convey to you we haven't arrived at this point uh, overnight. We've been working on this continuously, applying state-of-the-art technology that wasn't available in 1870. You can see the shaded hills on the right of the image. You can see the high-grade silver and copper showings. And you can see where the big IP anomalies are. IP maps sulfide as a chargeability in the ground. It's telling you that where you have evidence for the root of the Reveille system is not underneath the showings in the hills at surface. It's underneath the covered valley. And the showings are essentially distal. So these little lines here that you can see uh, up in the north part of the map are where VR has started its drill program on the shallow IP features, also magnetics and EM. And in April, this large IP anomaly was defined by the by the DCIP survey and our drilling through the next two to three months will move from the range front along that road where the drill holes are shown and move into this large IP anomaly. And this is where I think you have a, a shot, the potential in terms of understanding the size and the magnitude of that IP anomaly that you could have a silver system like what we see at Comstock at the other end of the belt. This is an old saying that my chairman will remember from Kamenko. We talked about this a lot in exploration. If you want to be successful in 2020, you don't go into an old district with old ideas to make a new discovery. You need to respect the exploration that was done in the 50s and 60s and 70s in these established mineral belts like the Walker Lane in Nevada by companies like Newmont and Phelps Dodge and Kennecott. They knew what they were doing. So what is VR going to do to bring something new to the table? It's critical that we at VR are not reinventing the wheel. So you can see the shaded topography image in 3D on the left, historic workings in 1870s. You can see some of the roads. We're not there on those surface showings despite their 2,200 ppm silver because our geophysics and our geochemistry is suggesting that the root of this system is under the unexplored covered valley. You can see our early stage holes. Some of the geochemistry is in, we're hoping it's in this in June, and those drill holes will eventually move out into this main IP anomaly. And that's where I think VR will have the courage to pursue something that can put a meaningful new silver discovery on the table in Nevada, akin to competing with the big silver um, deposits in Central and South America. I'm just going to leave this now with, I've just taken that 3D view and rotated it 90 degrees on the bottom. There's the Reveille range behind us, the 3D IP anomaly in front of the range under the valley. You can see it covering our drill holes, which have just started along the break and slope of the range where my cursor is. 
we're looking at these EM and gravity features here first before we move down into this large IP anomaly, which we think might be driving the fluids for the high-grade silver in the hills. In 1870, some beautiful uh, images in, in the valley, the old brickwork from the original mill for Reveille, taking that high-grade silver mined by hand in the hills. The steelwork and cement is probably from the 1920s and 1950s. VR is bringing new technology, whether it be geophysics or our ability in three-dimensional GIS world to ask ourselves, what's the upside of these showings in the hill? And hopefully in the next two to three months, we're gonna find out in this drill program and given the grades that we see at Reveille, that's something for you to consider as investors before that drill program and news release comes out. All right, let's go from Reveille down to Big Ten or up to Big Ten, same margin of the Walker Lane and down the road from Round Mountain, 20 million ounces and from a global perspective, Round Mountain is certainly one of the most famous epithermal gold deposits on this planet, period. There it is, photo we took in January looking south towards our Amsel. You can see here large heat bleach pads, large waste dump. The artisanal workings in Round Mountain discovered in 1907 at the beginning of the operation. And to my mind now, um, modern large-scale heat bleach mining started in the 1970s by Echo Bay. Um, and Round Mountain now, as Kinross's core asset, largest heat bleach uh, mine in the world, is what you would consider an important gold deposit for both Nevada and the world. And I want to show you why we think AMSOL has the potential to address, after nearly 100 years of production of Round Mountain, where's the next one? Where is the next famous gold deposit in the Walker Lane? And here's our AMSOL project, a project, uh, sorry, photo from about three years ago. Top of the hill, some artisanal workings from the 1920s and a little bit of trenching and a little bit of shallow RC drilling that you can see from the late 1970s. VR starting in 2016, large airborne and radiometric surveys, large hyperspectral surveys, some very sophisticated uh, ICP geochemistry with acaregia digestion um, and hyperspectral mineral mapping in both rocks to ask ourselves, A, the top of this hill is part of a two by three kilometer potassium anomaly, which is new in the VR survey. That's the first indication that you have a footprint that looks like Round Mountain. And the question is, where is the heart? And if you look at the geochemistry, and if you look at the geophysics I'm going to show you, you'll see that it looks like the heart of this anomaly is not in the center of the hill. It's off on the right, on the steep part of the hill that's tree covered, and it wasn't explored historically. And this is something now that VR, like Reveille, is something new that we can bring to the table. New data to show us maybe that Amsel actually could be the next round mountain but you're not gonna find that underneath the center of the hill. That's just the alteration cap. From a geology point of view, sorry, David, I've got to put another rock shot in here. This is what you'd want to find in the heart of the Amsel Doing system great, Mike. for a, a big gold system. This rock is brecciated. The yellow color is agillary, it's potassium alteration. It's a critical correlation to the 20 million ounces of gold around mountain. You can see these little open spaces. These are very high temperature gold fluids. This is where the pyrite in the quartz is hiding. The pyrite is also directly correlated to gold on this property and around mountain. If you can find the heart of this type of brecciation and alteration, and you can carry the kind of silver and gold that you can see uh, on this slide, that's how you've got a realistic shot at where is the next round mountain. Again, in the world of uh, 3D GIS, ArcGIS technology, which VR, thanks to its young chief geologist, Justin Daly, has the expertise to do. We can take our gold geochemistry, drape it on top of the radiometric anomaly, which is the potassium anomaly, roughly two by three kilometers. And you can see the footprint of alteration on the top of this hill. And you can see that there is gold throughout that alteration envelope. But let's take a look at the IP geophysics, state of the art, 3D array, 
mapping pyrite because we know the gold carries with the pyrite. And you can see that the chargeability anomaly, large, about 600 by 800 meters, and very high amplitude at greater than 20 milliseconds, is on the southwest flank of the hill. The southwest, whoops, sorry, the southwest quadrant of this anomaly. The roads, the historic work up on the top of the hill is essentially on the alteration count. These black diamonds are what we've been working on for permitted drill holes. And our goal is to test the northern lobe and the southern lobe of this IP anomaly for what we would call the deeply rooted uh, and higher temperature core, the system that is giving you all this potassium alteration. That's what it looks like in three dimensions. These blues being the, the largest, deepest, and, and therefore probably the greatest concentration of pyrite and potentially gold, and the northern anomaly. Again, you can see the roads, and you can see all our permanent drill holes. Our goal starting this summer, if we receive the permit this month, which is our expectation from communication with the Forest Service, is for the first time to get away from the hilltop and to put in first pass drill holes, deep holes, into these two IP anomalies. And as usual, a good cross section shows it all. Early shallow RC holes are showing you the gold fertility in this alteration cap. But that's not the potential prize in Amsel. If you want 20 million ounces, like at Round Mountain, would a drill hole here on the side, going down into this IP chargeability, would that give you the opportunity of two to 300 vertical meters of tuffocyte breadth shift, quartz vein stock work with adularia, pyrite, and gold to give you the kind of resource volume that you can see around mountain. This, this IP anomaly is showing you that potential. And this is why it matters. This is a, just a current stock photo of Round Mountain. The footprint of this current open pit is akin to the footprint of the potassium alteration at Amsel. I can't tell you what I'm going to find in this drilling, but I can tell you that our correlation with Round Mountain is not made lightly. I have been working on this project for three or four years. And the correlation that you can see in the top of this text has taken a lot of work for Justin and I to go through and understand what is this alteration system at AMSL. And we've done that so that we're not just going back in and reinventing the drilling from 40 years ago. That's simply not good enough. I just want to make a quick comment to you as investors about why the price of gold and copper is where it is. And one of the reasons is when you dig a big hole like that after mining for 120 years, two things happen. Your average grade goes down. The average grade of gold, of gold mines in the world has decreased by 50% after the last two decades. And unfortunately, it's a double, it's a double whammy. It's a one-two punch. What also happens is that your mining costs increase. And mining costs at gold mines have been increasing by 15% annually for almost 20 years. Part of it is inflation. Part of it is when you dig a big hole like this, when you expand your early high grade veins, you're simply moving more rock and it's expensive. What happens when your grade goes down and your cost goes up, your margins decrease, your board of directors gets antsy. And when you look at the graph on the left, this is really the challenge for the mining industry particularly gold and copper. Our discoveries have not been keeping up with production and demand for almost 30 years, since the 1990s. That's what the bar graph on the left is showing. What it's really showing in the past decade, even worse, is that as we have thrown more money into exploration, we have not produced more discoveries. That has meant that finally board of directors of most of the majors have put less money into exploration and this is where we are at today. This graph on the right I have sent to many colleagues and shareholders. Mike Doggett is one of the, the brilliant mineral economic evaluations people on this planet. Um, I'm lucky to have him as an old peer and shareholder. Mike sent me this graph from a talk in 2017. The two big colored uh, segments of the pie chart are showing you that Canada, top 10 gold producer in the world, right now, 
more than 90% of our gold production from mines is coming from mines discovered before 1990, and actually most of it from before 1970. Clearly that is unsustainable. And it's simply illustrating the point of <clears throat> this mine of Round Mountain started in 1907. The end of the illustrious, the end of the life of this illustrious deposit is nearly over. That's what this graph is telling you. Where is the next big hemlo in Canada or the next big round mountain in Nevada? That's what we need to do to push a rebalance in supply and demand. And that's why the price of gold is being pushed. And it's real. And that's what these graphs are telling you beyond VR what the gold and copper industries are facing. Okay, just to finish here, I just want to tell you about the third opportunity for this summer. I'm going now more into the copper gold world and rare elements. We're moving up into Canada. Maybe the similarity is a big crack in the earth, the KSZ, the Capus Casing Shear Zone. This is like the Walker Lane Belt. This is places where fluids get to surface and these fluids have metal. In the case of the Capus Casing, it's been active for 1.9 billion years. And if you're in mineral exploration, it's a good thing. Just quickly, Hecla Kilmer, although it's located uh, in Northern Canada, it's considered remote. There's no outcrop. There's some important features on this map. Number one, we own this property 100%. Number two, it's 25 kilometers from an active Northern Railroad that services James Bay and it services the Northern uh, Canadian National Railroad. It's also 25 kilometers from an Ontario Hydro One uh, dam, power generation facility, and the Northern end of Highway 634. What does that mean? It means that Mike Gunning, who is Scottish and my ge chief geologist Justin knows this, pennies matter at this company. We can do exploration here cost effectively. In the world of hyper, hyper uh, inflation, that is critical. How do you make discoveries in this economic environment? The location of this property matters. It also matters for what happens if you discover a world-class copper gold rare earth element deposit. From a development point of view, that railroad, that power dam, that highway, they matter. And if it's one thing VR will not do is waste my shareholders' money on making a discovery that major mining companies cannot advance or will not advance because it's uneconomic. VR, Mike Gunning, Darren Wagner are looking for discoveries that matter and are looking for discoveries that can be advanced. And this map is an intro to Hecla Kilmer, but it's also an important aspect of what you are investing in or considering investing in with VR. Why are we about to drill Hecla Kilmer? It's pretty simple. It's a big complex, carbonatite, six kilometers across. I just showed you on two previous maps, it's on a big crack in the earth. And we started our drilling last year, these two drill holes, two and four, on the edge of this magnetic anomaly. And we're showing you an example of what you can do starting in the late 1990s. Uh, our magnetic surveys have not changed in terms of collecting the data. What has changed, thank you, thanks to computers, is our ability to invert and model the data. This is a 3D MVI inversion. The model is simply telling you that that blue magnetic anomaly in that map has deep, robust roots. And this magnetic anomaly is secondary. It's because of fluid. And so we drill this anomaly because it looks like it could be a fluid source for this complex. And what did we find? In two drill holes, 200 meters apart, at the top of one drill hole, rare earth element mineralization and scattered copper and gold in the top 50 meters, and 600 meters below in the second drill hole. Again, you can see in these, in this case, thorium bars, the same style of mineralization, 600 meters below. These drill holes on a first pass, Hecla Kilmer, like Amsel, like Reveille, VR is drilling new targets. I want this company to have the conviction for new discoveries, not revamped discoveries. 
and this is what we're showing at Heckler Kilmer for the first time, is deeply rooted magnetic anomalies with this rare earth element mineralization. What does it look like? It's almost overwhelming. 600 meters of breccia top slide. Just to show you that I think 99 out of 99 out of 100 geologists would say this is how we envision IOCG breccias. They're hydrothermal rocks. They seek and destroy and digest everything in their path. The red hue is from hematite, in our case, a little bit of monazite. And in the bottom of that hole, you can actually see the pale gray monazites, the hydrothermal magnetite, and you can see up to half a percent uh, light rare earth minerals. Uh, in our case, we also have niobium and lithium. But 0.56 per 6 contained light rare earths, if you know light rare earth deposits around the world, is moving you into the economic threshold for where the world gets its critical metals. This was found in one hole, essentially at surface at Hecla Kilmer, and 550 meters lower in the next. In drill holes that were essentially 600 meters of hydrothermally destroyed uh, breccia. And here's an example of the lithium. And I'm sure I don't have to explain to people the importance of lithium on the electrification of the world and where battery technology is going. And this is an example of where the breccia is not full of rare earths, it's full of lithium. Here's the drill turning in good old Hecla Kilmer last fall, a little bit different than Nevada. Uh, but the importance is easy topography, proximity to that road and that railroad. It allows us, despite using a helicopter, to keep our drill costs low. It's important. And what we're showing you, what we found out of that drilling, is the correlation with these red dashed lines between some really state-of-the-art XRF scanning and density on the left, with the rare earth uh, mineralization, 50-meter intersection, the bottom of hole two, and look at the correlation between copper and density. VR responds to that by doing a detailed gravity survey this past winter, three months ago. What did it show? Showed that those drill holes and the high density mineralization that, at the bottom of hole two, the top of hole four, is on the margin of a 600 by 800 meter sharply defined, very high magnitude, high density anomaly. So if you want to see more of that high density rare earth elements and copper mineralization, simply drill into the middle of this gravity anomaly. This is not rocket science anymore. This is what VR will be doing literally two months from now. This is already permitted. I just want to leave you with why I think you should care about that drill program. Uh, to give Trump credit, he got this going. Biden is now fully behind it. The US is recognizing that 80% of the world's strategic metals, that can be for uh, coatings on glass, that can be a neodymium scenarium for moving magnets and permanent magnets for everything that is electrical and battery, whether it's server farms for social media, whether it's for EV vehicles or solar farms, and also for things like neodymium and scandium for making steel stronger and lighter for defense. Most of those metals are coming from China and North America is at a strategic disadvantage. If you want to understand what is a solution for what Biden is asking, you need to understand that the world is getting its critical metals from IOCG mineral systems. Bayanobo is so big that we don't even really know what the resource is, and it's in China. Olympic Dam is by far the, the largest rare earth element uh, resource in the world. It's also by far the, the biggest gold deposit in the world and top 10 copper. What are these deposits? IOCG mineral systems. So is Karuna in Sweden. So is Iron Hill and Mountain Pass in the US. They are, carb uh, sorry, IOCG systems coming into carbonatites. If you want to provide a solution for North America, we've been looking for these since Olympic Dam was discovered in 1976, and we haven't found one. Could Hecla Kilmer give you that solution? Palabor is not on my top 10 list for the big boys in uh, rare earth elements. It's lower down on the list. 
Here's Palabor in South Africa. It's a big footprint. It's almost a billion tons at 0.6% copper with almost half a million ounces of gold. This is just a stock photo. Why am I showing you this? The comparisons between Palabora and what VR has put on the table at Hecla Kilmer are striking. Hecla Kilmer is an IOCG fluid system hosted in a complex carbonatite. That is exactly what Hecla, uh, sorry, what Palabora is. The footprint of that open pit that you saw in the previous photo, the footprint of that open pit on the right that we have superimposed on the magnetics is roughly the same as the footprint of the gravity anomaly at Hecla Kilmer. This is giving you an example of answering the question, what could that gravity anomaly be? It's about the same size as Palabora, and it looks like it's the same IOCG Breccia system. Interestingly, they both occur on this magnetic contact. Again, that's something that uh, myself and my chief geologist could talk about for an hour, but big man, he's not gonna like that either. So I'll just try and finish off here with, Another really interesting correlation is the phosphorus. Hecla Kilmer has three, six, three to 6%. So does Palabora. That's probably because of monazite. That's where your rare, rare elements are occurring. That's what can give you a solution to what Biden is looking for. I want to leave you really with Hecla Kilmer and Amsel. They have the scale to make discoveries that matter. VR is not looking for discoveries with incremental value creation uh, for the insiders. I'm looking for things that will make a matter to my shareholders, to make a difference, I'm sorry, to my shareholders and to the mining industry. I've done that in uranium, Darren has done that in gold. And I wanna to convey to you with these three programs that that's the value creation that we're going after. I want VR to have that courage, it's blue sky, it's not for every investor, but when it works, it makes a difference. Uh, lastly, I just want to give you my last slide on money. It's how we do exploration. This rock is exciting from Reveille. It's what we're drilling right now. 2,060 grams per ton silver. That's 2,060 parts per million. That also stands for people, properties, and money. I've talked about the first two. Without money, it doesn't happen. And I just want to convey to you that VR has money. We just did a strategic raise. We've got about 3.6 million in the treasury. All of that drilling that, I've, that I'm talking about for the next six months is funded. So is our GNA through next year. Our share structure is tight. I'm fortunate to have uh, six institutions that have, investing, have been investing in Mike Gunning and Copper and Gold from when I formed this, this company. They are long-term holders. And together with myself, I'm still the largest shareholder in this company. I participated in almost every placement we've done. We still hold uh, between 45 and 50% of this company's stock. We are looking for the kind of value creation that I'm talking about in discoveries of this scale. We have the money to do that. The share structure is tight. And as I've tried to convey to you, as my chief geologist knows, I'm Scottish. Pennies matter. I care how much money this is costing me to own and capital to put this on. I want to put our money into the ground. I know that's how, how I create value. And we're going to try and do that on three different projects in the next six months. And I hope you will consider that window to get into this company before that happens. Thanks for the time. That's the visual snapshot of VR. Good luck with your investments this year. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. You'll be able to talk about geology again. Don't worry, Mike. We're going to go to questions. <laughs> Very well presented. Great story. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Doug Loud, who's going to handle the questions. We'll start with one himself, I'm sure. Douglas. Hi, Michael. How are you? A fascinating uh, presentation. It just gets better and better and more and more interesting. I mean, each of those projects could be their own really interesting mining company, and that you've got all three is wonderful. I apologize for the shooting noise in the background. The construction site across the street from me here in New York has just hit bedrock. Garnet mica schist, really hard stuff, and I'm afraid this noise is going to continue for a long time. Anyway, you touched briefly about getting permits in the summer. So could you just talk about 
your permitting issues and any problems with shortage of the availability of drills? And how deep are these drills going? Yeah, they're all they're all good questions. Uh, let me just start in the order that we presented. Uh, Reveille, we have our current permits. Um, we'll be able to carry out our drill plans for this summer, essentially on our existing permits. Uh, in terms of drills, I can answer that for both uh, Reveille and Emsel. Uh, you're right, with the rise in the price of, of gold and copper, when you're working in jurisdictions like Nevada and Ontario, uh, the good drill companies are in demand. Fortunately, again, for investors, VR didn't arrive in Nevada yesterday. We've been there for five years. We have been working with three or four different companies. Uh, the drilling for Reveille is more or less in hand uh, with the current drill company that we're using. I'm not worried about that. I don't have exact schedules. We've just finished a hole. We're hoping to do two or three more in a couple of weeks. We're hoping to be back in June or July. And we're hoping that that drill company will be able to do our first pass drilling at Amsel uh, essentially at the end of the summer. In terms of permitting for Amsel, it's a bit different. It's for service. We've been working with them for a year and a half. We've been talking with them for the past month. Our guidance is that we will see the permit this month in June. That's the case. Uh, our, our guidance to shareholders will be that we will drill uh, Amsel at the end of the summer. And I'm fairly confident that the driller that we have will be able to step up. But we're always working uh, with two or three. In the case of Absol and Reveille, they're easy drill holes. They're, they're 300 meters. Virtually any drill can do them. Those systems are, are near surface. For Hecla Kilmer, uh, permits in hand. We don't need a new permit to do this drilling. Uh, the drill holes are deeper because the system is deep. And the real excitement about Hecla Kilmer is can you get one of these IOCG systems with copper, gold, and rare earth elements? In the case of Carapatina in Australia, has produced 1,600 meters of continuous copper mineralization. These systems are high temperature. And you can see that at surface at Hecla Kilmer. If you get into copper, you have the potential for long intersections. So we go into Hecla Kilmer with a rig that we can fly cost effectively with a helicopter, usually gives us penetration of seven to 900 meters. And with a drill company of the quality that we have with us at Hecla Kilmer, we can generally get that hole done in about a week. That's that's very helpful. Um, the other question I had was you touched briefly on copper and much more so in Hecla Kilmer. Um, copper is, looks like it's getting to be an interesting mineral and an interesting part of your uh, portfolio. It, does it have a chance to upstage the gold and silver, or what do you think? I'm I'm getting older now, so I'm refraining I'm refraining from uh, prognosticating on the price of gold and inflationary hedging and government spending. But I will give you my feelings on copper because I've been in copper my whole life, and my my summary statement to you is: the world is about to find out that we have simply taken copper for granted in the last 40 years. I grew up when copper was 65 cents. And what happened in copper was two major innovations, one on the mining side, which was essentially big trucks and mining technology around big pits, allowed us to essentially expand and open, expand existing mines in South America at the expense of opening new ones by simply expanding our mining operations. On the heels of that was a uh, processing technology called SXCW. It allows us to do electro winning of copper on site, bypass essentially smelting. It's cheaper. You can do direct ship copper smelting. You can also deal with oxide at surface in South America on high grade resources. People don't understand how this changed the copper industry in, in the 80s, and the copper industry left North America in the 1980s. And where I'm going with all this was for 30 years, I would say, the mining world and the general public didn't need to worry about the price of copper on a supply demand scenario with US housing starts. Because if we needed more copper, we just expanded an existing mine, either by mining technology or by processing. And we didn't have to worry about discoveries. Because of that, literally since the late 80s, I can show you graphs from people like Mike Doggett that have shown this gap between 
discovery and demand has been getting wider for 30 or 40 years. So something has to change. Either we're gonna use less copper or we're gonna find more copper to close that gap. And with the population of this planet going to 10 billion, with the digitalization of this planet, with the electrification of this planet, if you understand how copper intensive wind farms are, how copper intensive server banks are for social media, and of course, if you listen to Freeland and talk about electric vehicles, which we all understand, but also just in baseload electricity with expansion of infrastructure electricity in places like Southeast Asia. Copper is involved in everything we are doing in this society. We have taken it for granted for 40 years, and we are about to find out in the price of copper why that is. We need more copper to sustain what is going on in both sustainability and electrification, and we don't have it. And if you understand the copper mining world, you will understand it's not so much about copper production, but where the big discoveries have been made. And to understand how much money has been written off in jurisdictions such as the DRC, Mongolia, Pakistan, Mauritania, even Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Alaska. The issue with new copper, where is the new copper coming for this coming for the server farm for Google? It's not coming from these projects in these jurisdictions. For 20 or 30 years, the copper industry has been hindered by developing these large projects. The goal of VR is to put a major copper discovery on the map at a place like Hecla Kilmer, or even Reveille or Benita, Nevada. In a jurisdiction like Nevada or Ontario, where I don't have to explain to Freeport McMorrin, you can advance this copper discovery. And that's why, to go back to your question, of all the commodity prices, I have the most conviction as a lifetime geologist in what's going on in copper right now. I really don't think the world understands how much we've been taking copper for granted. And I want VR to have the courage to not just make a copper discovery, but to have a copper discovery that the industry needs. And that is a discovery that it can actually advance. You can't advance a resource, sorry, you can't make a battery out of a resource. You need copper cathode. And for that, you need a mine. And that's where I think Nevada and Ontario can kick in. That is hugely helpful. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's call on uh, one of our panelists. Uh, Bruce Daigle, do you have any questions? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, gentlemen. Mike, uh, I knew very little about your company uh, before this. This was a, a extremely positive presentation, and I can't wait to do some more work on it. So thank you very much. I really don't have any other questions. You were very detailed, and you answered them all. So I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Victor Zhao, do you have any questions today? You have to unmute yourself. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Go ahead, Victor. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, your company uh, in, uh, used to explore in uh, Nevada for some time. And uh, are you still stick in same project as uh, before, like uh, copper gold in Nevada also? I'm sorry, which project? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, a few, maybe two or three years ago, you you explore in uh, Nevada. It looks like a good project also to me. Uh, are you still uh, do that same project in Nevada? In Nevada, yes. I mean, right now our priority is to continue with the drilling on what I would call the silver, copper, gold target at Reveille. 
it's near surface. We know exactly where to drill with this. Um, Absol, we've been waiting for this permit for a year and a half. I think we're going to get it, and we will drill hopefully at the end of this summer. Reveille plays into copper. Obviously, uh, Reveille and Amsel in particular play into gold. And I, I don't want people to uh, take my sorry for my lecture on copper to um, dismiss uh, the potential for gold at Amsel for this company. Um, but I also want my shareholders to know that uh, Mike Gunning and Justin Daly have not forgotten about Benita. It's what this company went public on four years ago. I believe there is still the potential for a, a world-class, a new early Jurassic uh, porphyry copper system discovery in Nevada. Uh, we started our drilling two years ago. Amsoil and Reveille are simply higher priority. Um, but I have not discounted the chance that Benita can still give my shareholders the chance of value creation on a major copper discovery there. I just want to get ourselves through Amsoil and Reveille first. Uh, my job as CEO is not my job as geologist. My job as CEO is to prioritize and to spend my shareholders' money where I think I have the best chance of creating value now. And I think that's Reveille and Amsel. Um, but does Mike, Mike Gunning want to continue drilling at Benita for a major discovery? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Vanderbilt, are you there today? Do you have any questions? Here he comes, I hope. But while he's unmuting, thank you for that wonderful copper speech. I wish I could have recorded the whole thing and played it for some of my people. It was just great. Sorry, I'm getting older. I'm... <laughs> I did record it, uh, and it'll be available in the replay. Don't tell Good. me that. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, there's uh, 300 million people in India who have no electric power, no capability yet even to have any. You know, have to run the wires, and it's just unbelievable. And you know, the EVs you know, mean, times the copper of, of a car, regular car. The easy thing to do is to talk about Tesla when you're talking about copper, but you're really missing the picture. The real picture is about how the developing world is going to catch up with places like New York and Vancouver for electricity because that's that dictates your quality of life and you need to understand that from the hydro dam or the coal plant or the nuclear plant to the generating station to the wind farm to the battery that stores the wind farm to the transmission line to New York from the transmission line to the server farm for Google, and eventually to the plug-in for the Tesla car. All of those involve copper. Tesla's high profile and so are server farms, but don't discount the push in the world to get the developing world caught up on what, from my uranium days, we call baseload electricity. And the way you do that is with copper and wire. It's still the best way to do it. And again, my summary is the same. The world is about to find out that we've been taking copper for granted. It really has. Absolutely. Uh, Scott, do we have any questions from the audience? We do, in fact. Uh, first question is, can you address the future plans for Ro R Roanoke? Or how do you say that, Roanoke? It's at least three times larger than Hecla Kilmer and shares many of the favorable attributes. Admittedly, it's harder and more expensive, but might the potential resource warrant a drill program? Well, I guess my short answer would be yes, 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 that's all true. Um, I view, I know there are different projects. Uh, for Justin Daly and myself, this is our uh, IOCG Copper Gold Rare Earth Element Hydrothermal Breccia Initiative on the campus casing. We have four properties now. We started at Renoke. We're into Hecla Kilmer. It's given us these breaches at surface. It's given us this detailed gravity anomaly. Uh, Renoke is larger on face value from the airborne gravity. We would need to get back in and do ground-based gravity probably, or perhaps even ground-based IP. And in the same way that I approach Benita with uh, Amsel and Reveille, I approach a Renoke and the two additional properties that we have staked um, subsequent to Heckler Kilmer in the same way. We advance them essentially collectively. Justin and I think about these projects 
um, the same way. But I'm sorry for my shareholders. I can't just magically do drop a an array of drills down from the, the clouds and just drill everything, nor do I want to. I want to drill in concert with my learning. And right now, the parallels between Hecla Kilmer and Palo Bora are very compelling. We know exactly what to do, and we're gonna do it in two months. Renoke will simply come into the fold when it's the right time, but all of the precepts from that question are on the mark and they align with the way VR is thinking. Thank you for that answer. Another question is, in Reveille, with the four drill holes that you showed on the graph already complete, do you have assay results from those or when will you get them? <laughs> My favorite question. We <laughs> have some of the assays. It has been a little disappointing. I, I think we went into this drill program thinking it would be four to eight weeks, which was better than the eight to 12 weeks, which we found last year. I thought that the geochemical labs were gonna pick up. I would say, unfortunately, that's not the case. We're gonna be looking at at least eight to 12 weeks. We've seen some geochemistry. We've seen all of our hyperspectral scanning. In the meantime, we've got the fifth core hole done. Um, we will start the hyperspectral scanning on that in a couple of weeks. And we hope to get the next two or three RC holes done also in the area of those first four holes. We're hoping to do those in the next two or three weeks. So it will be essentially an iterative process. And I guess to make a forward looking statement, I would say I would hope to have all of our geochemistry from the first pass RC by the end of this month. That would be my goal. Am I a little disappointed? Uh, yes, frankly, I am. Okay, good to know. Uh, and another drilling question. Once you have your permits at AMSEL, how many meters of drilling will you be doing in that first uh, pass and when would that be complete? I think my framework would be 2,500 to 3,000 meters. Sorry for the uh, US investors. We, I'm going imperial. I can't get that out of my head in Canada. Um, we would go in with half a dozen holes, 300 to 600 meters. Again, the upside at uh, Amsel is that we're not looking for a high-grade quartz vein. We are looking for 300 to 600 vertical meters in an IP anomaly that can give you a quartz vein stock work breccia that looks like Round Mountain and has got pyrite and gold throughout it. So we're not going to go in with, with a light drill that can give us 200 meters. We will test that IP anomaly to depth. I think we can do it uh, with the drill that we use at Reveille. I think we can do it cost effectively to uh, three to 500 meters. We should be able to do that in four to six weeks. And our goal will be to do that at the end of the summer. Excellent. Great. And, and another one, just the same question, how many meters of drilling uh, at Hecla this year? I think the goal would be to go in with say six holes of 500 meters, 3000 meters. Uh, the drill company there is simply as good as it gets to use the cliche. We are waiting to do this drill program to use the same group, to use the same rig. We are going to be in the same rocks as those first pass discovery holes in the breccia. So I'm pretty confident we can get four to six holes done, five to 600 meters. We should be able to do that in four to six weeks. Great, thank you. And the final question I have from the audience is, are there any uh, large majors in the area of the Hecla mine? Um, I know you said it was remote. In the area of Hecla Kilmer itself? Uh, I think, yeah, because the, the other part of this question is, and, and might any of them be a buyer, like a potential, um, somebody already in the area who has infrastructure that might um, eventually be interested in that, I guess. I'm, I'm about to make a very forward-looking statement as a geologist. If Hecla Kilmer is what we hope it is, this density anomaly is either copper and gold or rare earth elements. Uh, that has the potential to change the Canadian mining space and every major base metal mining and copper gold company in Canada, let alone the world, will be interested in that. We have been looking for this type of system in North America since 1976 when Olympic Dam was discovered. So Mike Gunning, the geologist, is saying yes. Um, Mike Gunning, the CEO, will pull that back a bit and say, we have infrastructure nearby. 
you have world-class gold operations down to the south at Kirkland Lake and down in Timmins um, that are essentially a stone's throw away. And you're in Ontario, a world famous 150 year uh, mining jurisdiction. So from the bigger picture to the more detailed picture of Hecla Kilmer, uh, the short answer is um, yes, that is the last of my worries. Great, good answer. And a comment just came in right now. Uh, any comments about the timing of the pending full spectrum REE analysis at Hecla Kilmer? Uh, yes, we have literally just received it. And I don't want my shareholders to underestimate how much data we have in Hecla Kilmer between, between some really sophisticated XRF chemistry, XRF density scanning, conventional geochemical sampling of the drill core. And now what we did was we resubmitted those pulps for a specific type of digestion, specifically uh, for detection of rare earth elements. And we have literally just received that. I'd like to try to convey the results of that um, to our shareholders uh, in June, once Justin Dady and I, my chief geologist, have had a time to integrate this. One of the things that I like about Hecla Kilmer, about its potential and its potential impact for our shareholders, is that it is large and it is complex. And it is carrying uh, potential, not just for what Biden is looking for in critical metals, but also for gold and for um, copper. And I think what I'm trying to tell the potential investors here and my shareholders is that VR is not simply a company that gets an assay sheet back in an email, runs its thumb down the column, looks for high copper numbers, puts a highlighter on it, and sends it out in a news release. That's not what we're doing. We are trying to integrate density, XRF, geochemistry, rare earth elements, copper gold, with some very unusual monazite pyrochlor calcopyrite mineralization so that when I tell my core shareholders this is where we're going I'm not just making it up we are integrating a diverse amount of data on a very large and complex target and that is all good so I'm telling my shareholders please be patient give us a bit of time I want to try and work in some petrology and really make sure we understand what is the nature of this, these critical metals? Because uh, I don't care if you've been in your, in your business your whole life, these minerals like monazite and pyrochlor in these dark IOCG breaches, um, they're tricky. And we're, we're in the midst of making sure that we understand it. And we're working with what I feel are the global experts at SGS in uh, Sudbury and Lakefield in Ontario. VR works with tier one partners. Excellent, uh, thank you for that. And I wanna thank everyone in the audience for sending in questions. As always, if you have further questions, you can email us and, and or uh, Mike directly, and we'll make sure that he gets uh, all the questions that are sent in. There will be a replay of this uh, event available later on this evening, and you'll get an email with um, a direct link to that. So I'll turn it back over to you, Doug. Thank you very much, Scott, and thank you, Mike. Do you have any final words for us as we move to close? Uh, no, I don't know if you're still working, looking at this sunset. Uh, yes. <laughs> the, the premise of this was simple. This company, after seven years, is going into three really exciting drill programs on three very different projects that can do what I built this company to have the courage to do, which is turn everything upside down from a value creation point of view. And the time to think about investing in this company is before that happens, not after. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Good luck with your investments. And uh, with that, uh, thanks to O&M for the facilitation. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, Scott. Have a great evening.